One other thing we should look at here is that there are ways for us to manipulate the relaxation time of the tissue. So for example, if we have some sample of tissue and we inject into this area a contrast agent like gadolinium. So a lot of you are familiar with gadolinium, that we use it, that it makes things light up or look like they're much higher signal, much whiter, brighter on a T1 weighted image. So what's going on with gadolinium is that there is a <clears throat> an interaction between the protons that we are imaging and the unpaired electrons of the paramagnetic gadolinium ion. Now this, elect this interaction, which is called a proton-electron dipole interaction, only occurs when there is very close proximity between the gadolinium electron and the proton that we're imaging. Specifically, it has to be less than three angstroms. And this is an all or nothing effect. If they're close enough, this effect occurs. If they're farther than three angstroms from each other, the effect doesn't take place at all. Right? This is a quantum mechanical interaction whereby energy is exchanged from those protons onto the gadolinium electron. This is an example of spin lattice relaxation. Someone asked before, what's, Karen, right? What's in the, so when you give someone gadolinium, you're adding something to the lattice that dramatically increases the probability that a spin lattice energy exchange will occur. That's, how, that's what gadolinium is doing at a quantum mechanical level. It is increasing the likelihood that those spins will be able to dump their energy into the environment which translates into right, a shortened T1 relaxation time. So how is it then that this relates to what we see on an image? Well, if we take an example, let's say we're looking at the <clears throat> So we're looking at the longitudinal magnetization over time here. And we have let's say muscle. And let's say for example there is some tumor growing in that muscle. Right? So the tumor is green. The muscle is red but they don't really look green and red in the image, so you can't tell them apart that way. The fact of the matter is that based on what I've drawn here, they're very similar, right? And that's the case, right? <coughs> Much of this pathology in terms of T1, normal tissue and pathology behave very differently. And you guys know that from your clinical work. When you look at a scan of, let's say, a soft tissue sarcoma growing in the you know, quadriceps or something, it you can see that it's there, but the contrast between the neoplasm and the normal tissue is not very high. They have very similar T1 relaxation times. Well, if we can give something like this contrast agent, and right, assuming that it can be differentially taken up by the tumor as opposed to the normal tissue, then what happens is there will be a dramatic shortening of the T1 relaxation time of the tumor. Essentially, we shift this curve to the left. Now, obviously, this only works if it only goes to the tumor. If it goes everywhere equally, then we have the same effect even on the normal tissue and we haven't gained anything. But for various reasons, right, it's more likely the contrast agent will be taken up by the tumor. And by doing this, we can generate a large difference in the 
T1 relaxation time, a shortening of the T1 relaxation time of the contrast material containing tumor. Well, if we then set up our scan and we choose to make our TR very long, we won't take advantage of that. Right? So when you do these contrast enhanced images, you want to make your TR appropriately short. Oh dear. You want to make your TR appropriately short so that you can take advantage of this difference. And you can go from what is essentially very little T1 contrast between red and green to a large amount of T1 contrast between red and blue. Yes? I know before we were saying to decrease the TR all the way you would optimize T1, but in this case you wouldn't be optimizing the tissue differences at an extremely low TR because you would, they would all be almost the same as being at a high TR. Is that, is that right? Or? Well, ultimately everything starts from zero here, okay? The pro one thing you have, to, you have to keep this all in perspective, okay? So first of all, you're correct that you could look at this and decide where you're going to have the maximum contrast. It's not going to be at zero because everything is the same at zero. It takes time for there to be some, you know, as things, as the longitudinal relaxation progresses, it takes some time for there to be some differentiation of those spins. But at the same time, keep in mind that imaging with a TR this short at least in this scenario that I'm showing you, wouldn't really be very practical because remember the images that we looked at. Right? When your TR gets very short, there isn't much signal there to start with. Okay? Now, so just as an example, okay, we'll come back to this one in a minute. So here, I could have put them up one at a time, right? When you look at this image, right? This is a T1 weighted image of the brain and there is a tumor here, meningioma, right? These are notoriously difficult to detect on non-contrast images. In fact, when MR first came out, long before my time, uh, before contrast agents were yet available, there were a lot of people who questioned the utility of MR because it was so hard to see things. But when you give the contrast agent, right, it causes such a dramatic shortening of T1 that you can really make quite a big difference. And then this is just a non-neuro example. Right? You can see that if you look at the non-contrast image, it's really hard this, to differentiate. I mean, where does the tumor end and the muscle begin? This is a T2 weighted image that makes it a little easier. But with contrast, right, differentially taken up by the tumor, you can generate a huge contrast in these T1-weighted images that wouldn't be there with just the, the native tissue. Are the protocols designed by trial and error? <sighs> it depends on, I guess, how you define trial and error. Well, I guess at this point there's some level of experience, but... Right, so, so I mean, this is, you're talking about like decades right, of, right. of experience but at this point. There's so, nothing innate to anything that you would say, okay, I should image at this point. I'm not sure what you like, mean. Like certain tissues, like at this point, I guess you do know that certain tissues have certain time to lack or whatever. Um, time. So I'm not sure, what, I'm still not sure what you're asking. So if, in other words, if you knew that you were looking at, let's say, a tumor in the liver, mm -hmm. would you choose certain parameters to yeah. optimize that? Yeah. Well, so basically, yeah, so we know, I mean, there's, there's evidence as to which settings, right, which types of, it's really not just, the, we're at a, a very early stage here, but so at, there's evidence that, you know, what your settings are, whether, you know, how you choose your TE or, T -E or your TR, how those are going to make liver tissue show up optimally as opposed to, you know, in musculoskeletal imaging or brain imaging, the parameters that we use are different. So based on knowing, you know, based on what it is that you're going after, yes, you would definitely decide on a, a different set of parameters. And those have been worked out over time by, by people, you know, starting someplace and trying to optimize it, typically by 
you know, parametrically or sequentially just modifying the parameters to get the best image quality that you can. I mean, this, this actually might sort of be an example of that. So these are two sets of images in the same person. This person is normal. And the TR is what I'm showing you here, a little over <coughs> 5,000 milliseconds. And the top row and the bottom row are acquired at two different echo times. So typically, we would look at these images and say that, well, this is a pretty short echo time. Remember that the TE we're using to modulate how much T2 information is in our image. And the shorter we make that TE, the less we are allowing T2 differences to sort of seep into the image. Whereas, you know, 104 milliseconds is, is pretty long. So this is an image where we have a lot of T2 information. This is an image where we are essentially suppressing that T2 information. Both of these are acquired at what is a pretty long repetition time. So this is going to have the effect of minimizing right, T1 contrast. So if you were going to describe the nature of what you're seeing in these two images, well, this group down here we could call T2 weighted images. We've minimized T1 contrast and we've maximized T2 contrast. Whereas the top row, we've also minimized the T1 contrast, but we've also done something to essentially minimize the T2 contrast. So what do these represent? Right, these are right, proton density images. Because once you eliminate the components of contrast based on relaxation, there's really only one thing that's left. Now notice that it also pertains that you can never eliminate contrast in these images that's a function of proton density. It's always going to be there. All you can do is modulate how much T1 and T2 information is going to be in your image. And of course you can never completely eliminate that either. So it's important to realize that if you sit down you know, next week to read an MRI scan and you look at this and you make your impression and you start to dictate your report and let's say this person, this one is normal but they have some little abnormality over here and so someone will say, and I see this in reports all the time, this area of high T2 signal, right? So you really can't say that. That's, that's not accurate because the signal in this image, even though it's true, this is a heavily T2 weighted image, but the signal at this location is dependent on, yes, on T2, but also on T1 and also on proton density and also on some other things that we'll talk about later in the week. And you can never completely eliminate these. There might be ways where we can generate an image where we actually quantify for each voxel in the image the T2 or the T1. But when you look at an image like this in the, in the sense that we've been talking about making these images, contrast is always going to be a function of all three of these parameters.